And we are back from break on the InfoWars Nightly News. Thanks to Darren McBreen for covering the news portion. Tonight we're joined by a special guest. He's the author of America's Nazi Secret. Is John Loftus, probably the foremost expert into all the financier connections on the American and British sides with the funding of the Nazis in World War II and everything that happened afterwards. He will help set the record straight and we'll get deep into history. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Loftus. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, could you first tell us about your background, everything you did as an attorney, as an intelligence officer, and, and what kind of things you're working on now? Sure, I was an Army officer, then I went to law school and was hired by the Attorney General of the United States, and I worked at the headquarters of the Justice Department. And because of my intelligence background, I had very high security clearances, many levels above top secret. Uh, I worked on the CIA cases and the Nazi war crimes cases. Until one day, somebody got the bright idea of assigning me to see if there are any Nazis hiding in America, and I found out they were. They were on the CIA payroll. But the CIA didn't know they were Nazis. Um, our State Department and the British Secret Service had dumped Nazis here, and when it turned out that it was a bit of a Cold War blunder, the British intelligence agent that was sending us Nazis to spy on Russia was himself a communist agent. So instead of getting anti-communist freedom fighters, the dregs of the Nazi war criminals were being sent to America. And we had two CIAs, one that worked for the Republicans, in, hidden inside the State Department, and one that worked for the Democrats. You see, no one ever thought that Truman would beat Dewey and they had already hired the Nazis when Truman was re-elected. So at this critical point in Cold War history, we actually had two intelligence services, two CIAs, one that hunted Nazis, the CIA, and one that recruited them, the OPC, the State Department. And that division has continued in American foreign policy as well as intelligence policy over the last half century. So I'm sort of a a specialist in uh, the Mission Impossible crowd, the, the ones where the secretary will disavow any knowledge of their actions. And basically, <laughs> these guys were bankers. They were in it for the money. Right. So when we get into the whole history of the CIA, that goes back to a lot of the Wall Street bankers. Many of them were skull and bones who helped set up the National Security Act. Uh, people like Harriman, the wise men, working with people like Dulles. Uh, where do you see all this converging around World War II? Well, it's funny. People don't realize that some of America's finest families funded Hitler. There's going to be a documentary coming out called American Secrets sometime this year or next. And it focuses on those families like the Harrimans and the Walkers and the Bushes. That, you know, people only know that uh, President Kennedy's dad bought some Nazi stocks. And people don't know that he bought them from Prescott Bush. They both went to Germany on the same ship before the war. So there were Americans who poured a lot of money. In fact, one of the causes of the Great Depression might have been the relocation of American investment capital from companies like Brown Brothers Harriman, where the, the Rockefellers had their money parked. And they moved that money to buy stock in German companies. And it was supposed to be a great big bargain. Germany had a high-tech monopoly in the 30s. But unfortunately, you know, Hitler came to power. And instead of being a dog on a chain to keep the anti-communists and the labor unions at bay, Hitler seized control of the New York investors' funds. And from then on, they had a choice. They could either expose Hitler or they could collaborate with Hitler and try and save their money. And sadly, most of these people became traitors. During World War II, some of America's finest families gave aid and comfort to the enemy. They kept financial assistance to the Third Reich going on all during World War II. But hadn't they even before that set up the eugenics regime, a uh, partnership between the Anglo factions, the Rockefellers had supported the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Uh, all this had moved over to Germany along with the industrial machine. So the financing really met with a lot of uh, very serious foreign policy and, and kind of private partnership agendas. Well, 
I think what you have is, and I don't want to overstate the case, there were some wackos with a lot of money who thought that eugenics was a serious movement. And, and they believed in racial superiority and that those who had money were obviously racially superior, ignoring the fact that they inherited their money from mommy and daddy, who sometimes had done very despicable things to acquire the family funds. Um, the eugenics movement was, you know, it's so colorful, I think, that it distracts attention, and people look for a great conspiracy. You know, when sharks swim in parallel lines, they're not conspiring together. They just all smell blood in the water and are racing to get there first. What we had was, a, was an awful lot of very rich and very greedy Americans, Republicans and Democrats, but mostly Republicans, who thought that Hitler was the way to make a lot of money because he would allow them to have cartels, monopolies, and trusts that were forbidden under American law. Right. But, uh, you know, these guys had worked out a loophole uh, called the Webb Pomerine Act of 1918, where they could set up trust monopolies and cartels overseas. And some of them invested in Bolshevik Russia, and some invested in the nascent Nazi Party of Germany. Well, the Russian investment didn't go so well, but the German investment looked like it was going to pay off in spades. Nobody thought America would ever go to war against Hitler. In fact, it was Hitler who declared war on us, not the other way around. Sure. So uh, going to the post-war period, leading up to the Nuremberg trials, you say they were fixed. Uh, can you lead us up to, you know, what all was going on with that, the role of uh, the Justice Department here in the United States in covering up all the Nazis who had been shipped in, and talk about Operation Paperclip. Sure. After... Uh, Dewey surprisingly lost to Truman. The spy service inside the State Department was in a rough place, and they worked with the Justice Department on a cover-up. The Justice Department was in this up to their eyeballs. They knew that Nazi intelligence agents were being brought into America illegally. And, uh, you know, a lot of attention has been paid to the Nazi scientists and it's colorful, but you missed the big picture. What you don't realize was that the British intelligence officer helping us recruit these Nazi scientists was a guy named McLean. Donald McLean was Kim Philby's best buddy. He was also a communist agent. So instead of getting the Nazi scientists who could actually build rockets, we got the Nazi bureaucrats. We got the guys who were war criminals, guys like Arthur Rudolph, who used human beings as if they were disposable chemicals. He had these underground caves where they assembled the V-2 rockets. Uh, Werner von Braun, you know, a very patronizing bureaucrat. But what happened is uh, the British made sure that the best of the Nazi scientists went to Moscow. That's why Sputnik came out first. And all we got were the scientists that kept exploding rockets on the pad. The, same thing, the sad thing is President Harry Truman had explicitly forbidden this. He had ordered that the military could never recruit any German who was a voluntary member of the SS, who was wanted for war crimes, or had a low Nazi party number. And the army students said, oh yes, Mr. President. And they lied to their teeth. The this army and the State Department fixed the records so that these German scientists could come to America. And it was a hilarious farce. You know, when Kim Philby finally defected to Moscow, um, all the State Department could do was, was bury the files. Until 50 years afterwards, I, I stumbled across them. I was the first American to go into these underground vaults and, and look at the records of what really happened at the beginning of the Cold War, back when America had two spy agencies. And what the State Department and guys like Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster Dulles had done was beyond despicable. The Dulles brothers wanted to cover up for the American clients who had invested in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And they did that by saying that, well, we use Nazi intelligence officers to spy on Russia, and it's all hush-hush. 
And that's how they shut down all the money laundering investigations. And it turns out that the money was being moved, and this embarrasses me as a Roman Catholic to say, the money was being moved to the Vatican. It was the one bank in the world that had diplomatic immunity. And the Vatican Bank would move the money out of Europe to Latin America, and then back to West Germany for the great economic revival of West Germany. Sure. And all it was was that, you know, Chase Manhattan Bank, the Rockefellers, they were just getting their money back if they had invested. And respectful, respectively, the Vatican had also uh, been part of the rat lines and shipping Nazis to foreign countries as well. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't just ship the money out, you know, because the Nazis who were left behind would complain about it. So they had to devise a way of doing that as well. So here's the tragedy. I have friends who are, you know, very old men now who were Nazi hunters inside the U.S. Army, and they burglarized the Vatican's uh, rat line, the, the, the smuggling system, and found out how it was going. And the State Department ordered them hands off. And I had that in writing. So, uh, yeah, it was one of the most despicable things that our State Department had ever done. I was astonished. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, can you get more into the cover-up? How many documents have been destroyed and leaked and lost and covered up and kept under secrecy? And how did you get access to them? Well, you know, the, the funny thing is you can't really destroy top-secret files because there's too many copies. And any time you want to destroy a top-secret file, you have to make records of its destruction. So the best thing to do is misfile them. So they dump the Nazi records out in the vault where the nuclear secrets were stored. So I was a, a newly appointed Nazi hunter. I thought I'd get a free trip to Germany out of it. I knew nothing about the subject. But because I had all these super high security clearances, I needed them to get into the vaults. There are 20 vaults underground at Suitland, Maryland. Each vault is one acre in size. And, and top secret won't even get you close to getting inside. You need much, much higher. So I was the first guy in a half a century who had every security clearance under the books. I was the only one who could go to the index in Vault 2 and find out that there was a Nazi file on someone and then go down to Vault 6 and read that he had been recruited by the State Department. So I spent two years uh, going through the classified files of every U.S. and NATO agency. And I was appalled at the incompetence. We actually had one American spy agency inside the State Department that lied to all the others. And it really wrecked American security. We actually had a, a, a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Shakish Kavili, um, and he didn't know that his own daddy was a Nazi war criminal. We couldn't even do basic security checks. That's how much damage our State Department did. Those guys, I'm not saying they should have been hung, but they should have been prosecuted and gone to jail. The guys who should have been hung were the people like Alan Dulles that helped Hitler during the war and then covered it up afterwards. Can you elaborate on his role during the war? Yeah, Alan Dulles was the... American intelligence chief in Switzerland during the war. And 40% of the wartime supplies for the Third Reich moved through Switzerland. And these supplies have been bought and paid for by Dulles' American clients and some British clients. So Dulles was sort of a double agent. Uh, he was supposedly working for the Americans to get intelligence on Germany. But at the same time, he was really mostly working for the Nazis to protect his clients' investment, to launder the funds, if you will. And he was very good at that. So if you look at all the behind-the-scenes stuff going on with, with the networking and the money that was there, what becomes the real narrative of World War II? Why, why were we fighting? Uh, was justice served and who won the war? What, you know, what happened at Nuremberg? How many people were really prosecuted compared with the real Nazi apparatus? And how many people got away? You see what I'm sure. asking? Now, world War II was a, you know, a righteous war if there ever was one. I mean, you know, Hitler and Nazism and their cruel racist doctrines uh, had to be stopped. I mean, it wasn't a question really of a choice. Hitler would have kept on invading one country after another until somebody stopped him. Mm -hmm. And the British said no, and we agree with the British that, that this time this man had to be stopped. Um, 
the corruption didn't really come on the American side until much later. We were Boy Scouts. We were the last nation on earth that kept hunting Nazi war criminals. We tried to do the right thing. My first boss was actually a Nuremberg prosecutor at the bankers' trial, the Nazi bankers. You see, President Roosevelt wanted to put the German bankers on trial so that they would say, but we were only doing what the American bankers asked us to do. And that way, the German bankers at the Nuremberg trial would wipe out the whole funding base of the Republican Party at Wall Street. By some estimates, uh, nearly 70% of the funds that went to build the Third Reich before World War II came from Wall Street. And uh, again, those guys that kept the money flowing and covered it up, that was giving aid and comfort to the enemy in time of war. And my own Justice Department was despicable. We had, uh, I think there were more than 150 Americans from different companies who stayed in Nazi Germany during the war to help the Nazis run their companies. And General Motors truck companies, Ford oil companies. And these guys were arrested after the war, kept in a special prison. And they were all released, everyone. They never were charged as traitors. They should have been. Absolutely. Absolutely they should have been. Can you talk about uh, Ashcan and Dustbin and, and the financiers being held there and what happened? Yeah, Ashcan and Dustbin, those were the code names of the very special prison camp where the American and British Nazi collaborators, the traitors, were being kept. Now, there's a buddy of mine, Don Jensen, who's still alive. He's one of the guards of the camp. It was a British camp in the British zone, but it had American guards. So no matter who came nosing around, you could say, well, you're British, this is an American problem, go away. Or the other way around. And one of the guards, Don, uh, when he was a young private, uh, turned to one of the Americans and said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm not going to be here long. I work for the Chase Bank. My friends will get me out of here. And Don said, what do you make you so sure they even want to recognize you? <laughs> the man just laughed. The prisoner was right. He was let go. All of them were let go. Um... Ashkin Dustbin was the heart of the cover-up. A lot of, you know, people say, oh, conspiracy theories. There was, this, this was a crime. Ashkin Dustbin was a prison camp that contained American and British collaborators who stayed in Nazi Germany during the war. They should have been put on trial for treason. But putting them on trial would have exposed the Rockefellers, the Walkers, the Bushes, the Harrimans, the Kennedys, and so on. You know? And mind you, Harriman and Bush money was, was frozen at one point through the Union Bank, but then they were never prosecuted. And I'm sure there are dozens, if not hundreds, of examples like that, right? Yeah, well, see, Union Bank in New York was run by Prescott Bush. Actually, he was sort of the alcoholic son-in-law. He was dumped on all the boys, but he didn't do much. The evil guy was his father-in-law, Herbert Walker, as in George Herbert Walker Bush. Right. Herbert Walker was the, the real genius that got us involved with the Nazis. So Prescott's in charge of the Union Bank and also some companies that helped Auschwitz, if you can believe it. But there were three banks. There was one in Berlin, one in Amsterdam, one in New York. So no matter which side won World War II, one of the banks would pop up and say, hi, I'm neutral. Give us all our property back. And that's what happened. The Amsterdam Bank popped up and said, oh, those nasty Nazis stole all our corporate property in Germany. Please give it back to us. And the Allies did. So, you know, you don't have to, you know, smuggle the money out and have gold trains. You just have to move pieces of paper to show that, you know, whichever bank you want really owns the property. And that was a very clever theft. That's what happened. They paid off uh, Prince Bernhard of Netherlands, the crown prince. Right. Uh, uh, I guess he made over a billion dollars uh, in this uh, covering up the Nazi money laundering through the Netherlands after the war. See, that's what so, I mean. I'm not trying to connect dots when they're not there, but you've got Prince Bernhard, who later founded the Bilderberg Group, carried so many of these big American financiers, the Europeans as well, and you see the Harrimans from Union Banking, you see the wise men, John J. McCloy, you see George Kennan, all of these people part of this network that's involved in covering up for the whole Nazi thing. When I interviewed some of these guys, I called up McCloy. He was, uh, I think he just retired as chairman. 
at the Chase National Bank. And I said, look, you were the American High Commissioner of Germany. How in God's name could you pardon these Nazi war criminals who had been convicted at Nuremberg of financial crimes? And he said, oh, is, is it the request of the Vatican? And I bet it was. You know. mm -hmm. Now, the Vatican wanted to get its money back. Hitler was very clever. Um, there was a big financial settlement with Mussolini and the, and the Pope before World War II, and all that money was stupidly invested in Nazi Germany. So to keep the Vatican quiet about his atrocities during the war, Hitler said, you know, would just dribble the money back to the Vatican. As long as they kept their mouth shut about the killing of the Jews, they'd get their money back. So, um, you know, if you want to talk about cons horrible conspiracies that actually happen, start with the Vatican Bank. I mean, that place is obscene. Um, I, had, I had volunteered to help a group of people sue the Vatican Bank because um, we have documents, American classified files, showing, for example, money stolen from Croatian Jews was laundered through Switzerland, through the Vatican Bank, to Nazis in South America. Well, gee, a lot of that money stuck to the Vatican's hands. The Vatican secretly controls some of the largest reinsurance companies. Uh, so, yeah, the, the Vatican became the money launderer of choice. Uh, these guys, by the way, you can't say that it was an ideological conspiracy. They tried to fund both Hitler and Stalin. Okay? They didn't care who won. It was all about the money. Sure. Sure. <clears throat> so uh, I didn't get to read through your whole book, but I did notice where you brought up Kissinger and uh, how you've had some confrontations with Henry Kissinger over the years, and you've read his files. Tell us uh, what you found out about him. You know, it's funny. Uh, Seymour Hirsch was doing a big expose on Henry Kissinger, uh, Price of Power. And just as his book was in galleys, but just before it was to be printed, someone at CIA said, how can you do a book about Kissinger without interviewing Loftus? He's the only one who's read all the Kissinger files. And so uh, Hirsch flew up to my law office in Boston and said, well, what do you know about Kissinger? And I said, well, do you want to start with his intelligence background after the war? He said, you mean Kissinger was a spy? He said, oh, yeah, yeah. I can't prove that Henry Kissinger ever recruited Nazis, but I can prove that he worked at every classified file center where the records of the Nazis were stored. Um, and Hirsch was stunned, so I became his secret source, and he added a whole bunch of stuff in the book. And when the book came out, it was a big success. And Henry Kissinger's lawyers called Seymour Hirsch and threatened to sue. And it was all about the Nazi information. And uh, Hirsch called me up and said, and you know what, I told him I, I just got the information from Loftus. And they hung up the phone, they never called back. So, yeah, I think Henry Kissinger is one of the worst people in American history. He's, and he's a Nobel it's, Peace Prize winner. Uh, yeah, so is <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, can you get more into the Justice Department, their larger role uh, in this and so many other incidences, really working against justice, uh, as you argue in many cases? You know, it was so sad. There was a, a special law that Justice set up where the intelligence agencies could bring up to 100 uh, people a year who weren't eligible to get visas to America, let alone become citizens. But the 100 Persons a Year Act uh, was run by the Justice Department, and they brought in, like, the head of the Ukrainian Gestapo. His name was Mykola Lebed. Guy became a U.S. citizen, and the Justice Department had it covered up because the Attorney General's signature was on the file. So they, the Justice Department told the CIA and President Truman and eventually Congress that Nicole Abed was part of the anti-Nazi resistance. Now, here's a guy who murdered Simon Wiesenthal's mother, <laughs> whose Ukrainian Gestapo, called uh, the Shushba Beshba, uh, murdered hundreds of thousands of Jews, Poles, his fellow Ukrainians. This guy was a monster. The Justice Department created a whole fictional biography for the guy. And so here I am, sticking my neck out. I, I, I quit the Justice Department. I go on 60 Minutes. 
And we had a great time. You know, Congress was outraged. They demanded hearings. Mike Wallace got the Emmy Award. My family got the death threats. Yeah. And when we yeah. finally get around the hearings, I, the Justice Department fixed one of the guys, the committee chairman, so that I could not testify in executive session. That meant I couldn't tell any of the classified files. I couldn't tell about Nicola Labette. It wasn't until recently that I discovered how complete the lies were. So the Justice Department itself bears substantial responsibility for the protection of Nazi war criminals in America and for the entry of senior Nazi war criminals whose visas were personally signed by the Attorney General. So, yeah, a couple of those attorney generals probably should have gone to prison as well. And so everything you saw as part of the larger pattern of the media refusing to report on what's really going on, uh, clandestine files can't be opened or reported on, your book can't get reviewed for 30 years, justice won't prosecute the people. Uh, what are we going to do? How are we going to make it to the future in terms of all the criminals working within the system hide behind the National Security Act or hide behind you know, anything they can use to their advantage, but the whistleblowers like yourself are prevented from coming forward or ignored, or how do we fight back against this? Well, you know, the funny thing is, in the long run, the people that classified all this stuff have uh, stuck the dagger in, in their own hearts. Because sooner or later, all of the files will be declassified. Now, Congress said to the, all these spy agencies, declassify all your Nazi files, and this time has gone by. But one-third of all the Nazi records are still kept in secret vaults. Well, know why? Because there were files that came from the British, and the British rule was 75 years have to elapse before mm -hmm. their files could be released. So sometime starting between 2015 and 2025, we're going to see a whole torrent of Nazi files coming out in London and in Washington that are going to shock people. So I just tried to preserve as much as I could so that future historians will be able to find a path of the files, make sense of them, how they work, because these guys left a written record of their crimes. Every time they censored something out of one of my books, it was admitting that what I was saying was true. For example, um, we routinely wiretap all American phone conversations, all of them, every day. It's an electronic vacuum cleaner. And then someone from the British Secret Service sits down at an NSA computer and decides which names to search for. So we can literally pull a conversation out where the word Israel is mentioned and find anyone that's talking about it. Um, but when Congress asks, or the, or the judges ask, you know, both sides can truthfully swear that we aren't spying on our own people, and they're not. Well, the, they're spying on the other guys, people that's swapping information. It's an exchange. It's, it's an exchange. The Americans use the GCHQ people, computers, to spy on the British people. And the British Secret Service uses NSA to spy on the American people. Who needs search warrants? So the Bill of Rights is just, uh, you know, uh, a typo. It doesn't mean anything anymore. And this cover-up has gone on too long. That's got to stop. Uh, and, you know, this whole thing that began with a cover-up of the Nazi money using national security to cover up the movement of Nazi money and the, and the migration of Nazi businessmen, uh, that's going to haunt the very corporations that uh, began it. Uh, corporations are people in America. Well, we're the only country in the world that treats corporations as people, but people can be executed for their crimes. And I think there's a reasonable chance that when all of these files come out, our kids are going to look at the Rockefeller companies and the Harriman companies and say, you guys don't deserve to be in business. We're going to dissolve your corporations and give the stock to the victims. Um, I think that would be justice. I think it would be financial justice to actually, you know, break up these corporations and sell the pieces, you know, benefit uh, the Veterans Retirement Fund.
But, no, the but there's a big challenge, too, because the apparatuses they built are offshore. They have loophole after loophole. It's very sophisticated companies they have now. All of them are here in America, and all the evidence is going to show how it worked. Um, you know, it's too late to destroy the files. The guys that did this are dead. Mm -hmm. And their successors in the corporations don't even know where all the pieces fit. So one of the ironies of the classification system is that it has preserved very well uh, the fingerprints of crime and linking back to the corporations in America that made a profit off World War II on the wrong side of the war. It would be very interesting if it all comes out. I wonder what the people would think if, if they ever actually sat down and read it. And I think the people are going to say that we fought World War II to make America safe for Nazi retirement or Rockefeller investments. I think the Republican Party is going to take a big hit. Yeah, I, res I respect that you say it's a Republican Party thing, but I, I just don't see it when you see the connections between Union Banking and between Rockefeller and so many other entities. It, it all looks very integrated to me. At the corporate level, I could see, but, but I see the corporate level pursuing its own agenda. Yeah, I think what you had was a, uh, you know, you had both Democrats and Republicans that had invested in Germany in the 20s and 30s and then panicked and collaborated with Hitler in the 40s and then tried to hide their crimes in the 50s under clouds of national security. And the Dulles brothers who came to power in the Eisenhower administration, um, they, you know, they actually did more harm than good to the investors by classifying their crimes. So yeah, maybe there'll be some justice. Maybe it's too late for justice, but it's not too late for the truth. And if we find out what really happened, you know, with all this, the movement of this money back in the 20s, my God, if these guys could fund Hitler and Stalin and get away with it, what could they be doing now? And I have a pretty good idea what they're doing now. Please tell Please. us. One of the Nazi groups that we funded and protected after World War II were the Arab Nazis. Um, and this was a huge successful project of the Third Reich, of the Abwehr, the German intelligence service. The, the Muslim Brotherhood was a proxy arm of Nazi intelligence. They were supposed to be an underground army, uh, you know, a half a million secret Nazi members working for the Third Reich. And they did uh, try various coups, for example, in Iraq during World War II that was crushed. But there were Arab Nazis. There were about three-quarters of a million of them at war's end. And none of them were ever punished because the British Secret Service guys like Kim Philby and McLean um, made Egypt a safe haven for all the Arab Nazis. They brought them back to Cairo. Even the German officers that ran these programs were given Arab names and converted to Islam. So... The Muslim Brotherhood, though, was a real threat. You know, they, they knocked off the, the king of Egypt, and, uh, and they were a threat when the new uh, secular uh, regime came in the 50s. They were expelled. By then, the Dulles Brothers had come to power under their gullible dupe Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. And the Dulles Brothers convinced the Saudis to resettle the Muslim Brotherhood, all the Arab Nazis, and put them in Saudi Arabia. And the Saudis said, well, why not? You know, uh, the Saudis were pro-Nazi during World War II. And the Egyptian Nazis, the rest of the Arab Nazis, at least were literate. So the Saudis put them to work as school teachers. And the Arab Nazis became the leaders of the madrasas. You had a perfect storm of Saudi religious bigotry called Wahhabism or Salafism and Nazi racism. Um, young men like Osama bin Laden were literally tutored by Nazis. Um, his personal tutor was the brother of the chief Nazi propagandist for the Muslim Brotherhood. But the idea for the Dulles brothers was that uh, we would keep the Arab Nazi Nazis as a proxy army to fight the Arab communists during the Cold War. And every once in a while, they'd take the Arab Nazis out of the closet for one purpose or another. The last time we took the Arab Nazis out was when Vice President Bush sent them off to Afghanistan to recruit a new generation of freedom fighters. We actually had World War II Arab Nazis coming to America to recruit Mujahideen, the freedom fighters, to go to Afghanistan. 
um, we actually built, through the Muslim Brotherhood, a, a separate terrorist organization that was not controlled by CIA, as the conventional wisdom has, or by the U.S. government. It was run by the Saudis and the Pakistanis, but funded with American money. But no one knew the money was going through these old Nazi conduits. And so when the war was over, and America said, oh, we won in Afghanistan, we threw the commies out, we went home and left this huge army of the second generation of Arab Nazis in the field. And, you know, they formed a base, the Arab word for which is Al-Qaeda. Okay? Uh, and if you think about it, Al-Qaeda, the Nazis had identical goals. They were against democracy, Britain, America, Western culture, Jews. Um, they are very much second generation Nazis. And one of the reasons we're fighting Al-Qaeda today is because we never finished the job against the Arab Nazis after World War II. They were protected first by the British Secret Service and then by the Dulles Brothers in their intelligence service. And it's a horror story that's coming back to haunt us. The Muslim Brotherhood has now gained power through the ballot in Egypt and is threatened to uh, overthrow a whole crescent of states that are tending to go Islamist in the next election. So we have Islamist extremes. And please understand, these guys are not about Islam. Um, the Salafists are to Islam as the Ku Klux Klan is to Christianity. And that's why the Nazis only recruited the extreme groups like the Salafis uh, to join the Muslim Brotherhood. So it is wrong to say that this is Islam. Islam is a very pacifistic, genial, sort of anything-goes religion, particularly among the Sufis. Um, but what we have now are, in the Muslim Brotherhood is a very well-organized group of extreme cultists. Think as if the Ku Klux Klan had taken over Texas. And that's what's happened in Egypt. That's what's going to be happening all across the Middle East. And that's the legacy of the Dulles Brothers. But Mr. Mr. Lasfus, the whole thing is a tangled web. Uh, we're now partnered with al-Qaeda in Libya, now in Syria. The whole Arab Spring had a covert uh, Western uprising to it, and yet the power falls to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, how do you explain this channeling of power into the most extremist groups and the continuation of these terrible partnerships? Yeah, again, you know, the, the easy thing is to say, well, it must be a conspiracy. There must be some ideological connection here. And there isn't. Um, I hate to say this, but WikiLeaks does serve one purpose. If, if you go through all the collected WikiLeaks stolen cables and search for Freedom House, okay, you'll get the whole story of what happened. For about 10 years, Democratic and Republican administrations agreed that we had made a mistake in backing the Arab dictators in the Middle East, that sometimes, somehow, we had to make a transition to democracy. Well, during the Clinton administration and carried on the Bush, the idea was, you know, no more talk, let's do it. So we brought young people from all over the Middle East to Washington and trained them on how to use cell phones, the Internet, uh, you know, to organize demonstrations for a peaceful, nonviolent overthrow of their governments. And you'll see in the WikiLeaks cables that all these kids were told the same thing. All of the uprisings are set to take place in 2011. Now, we thought that if these young people were so capable as to overthrow all these regimes, they would certainly be capable of organizing a political group strong enough to win an election. On that part, we were terribly wrong. Uh, the kids were just incompetent. They only did half the job. And uh, so the Israelis just shake their heads at us and go, how can you guys be so stupid? How could you overthrow the Mubarak regime but not have a solid, moderate, democratic regime to take its place? Instead, we let the organized groups, the, the second-generation Nazis, if you will, who have been organized for a year, they were superbly placed to seize power. We didn't see it coming. Our great intelligence services really dropped the ball on that one. Most of the time, it's 90% stupidity and 10% conspiracy. That's how the world of covert operations actually works. So, 
the Freedom House organization to train young people for a 2011 uprising was a well-intended mistake because they had only planned for the uprising and not for the elections to follow. A huge mistake, and it may take decades for democracy to regain a foothold after the Arab Spring. You know, uh, groups, these Islamist groups, uh, believe in, you know, one man, one vote, one time. In the Palestinian area, we saw Hamas. Hamas came to power not because anyone liked them. They had about 20% of the vote normally. But everyone voted for them because they wanted to get the PLO and Arafat's people out because they'd stolen too much. But once Hamas was in office, they would never allow another election. And to this day, they haven't. Um, I doubt that there will be another Egyptian election. Mm -hmm. um, and so we may have created a monster. But the funny thing is, dictatorships and groups like the Muslim Brotherhood only survived and thrived because of illiteracy. And they got away with all this pro-Nazi stuff, you know, during World War II and afterwards because the people were illiterate. Now television and radio and cell phones have changed all that. I mean, the people of Iran who have been illiterate for years have just learned that there's oil in their country. They want to know where's all the money going. Uh, so there are more uprisings to come. In the long run, I'm betting that democracy will win, but the Arab Spring was a very clumsy but well-intentioned initiative. Sure. Sure. Now, switching gears, tomorrow is the anniversary of the 7-7 bombings in London. We've got a short clip of you here from 2000, well, after 2005 on Fox News, talking about Aswat, supposedly the uh, ringmaster of the attacks, being MI6 agent. Let's roll that clip. They were headed by, uh, you know, the uh, Captain Hook, right. the uh, imam in London, the Finsbury right. Mosque, without the arm. He was the head of that organization. Now, his assistant was a guy named Aswat, Harun Rashid Aswat. Aswat, who they right. picked up. Yeah. yeah. Aswat is believed to be the mastermind of all the bombings in London. From on the 7-7 and 721, this is the guy, we think. This is the guy, and what's really embarrassing is that you, the entire British police are out chasing him, and one wing of the British government, MI6, or the British Secret Service, right. has been hiding him. And this has been a real source of contention between CIA, Hold on, John. Justice Department, and Britain. MI6 has been hiding him. Are you saying that he has been working for them? Oh, I'm not saying it. This is what the Muslim Sheikh said in an interview in a British newspaper back in 2001. So he's a double agent, or what? He's a double agent. He's yeah, working we'll for the... So he's Okay, and the clip goes on, but basically the British are protecting him because he's a double agent of some kind. The Americans don't know. They're trying to capture him. But there's the Justice Department. They're interfering again. Uh, they're letting this guy skirt by. What's going on with this case? I know you haven't followed up on it recently. I really haven't either, but it's still part of this larger pattern of why we're so entangled in the Middle East and, and what a tangled web all this stuff seems to be. It, it, it's so hilarious. Here was a guy, Aswat, who was running from country to country, and the CIA would track him down, and they'd say, okay, to the local host country, please arrest him. And all of a sudden, the guy would slip out of their fingers, and the British Secret Service was literally moving him from country to country, one step ahead of the CIA. The British had made a deal with the devil. They had allowed a neutral zone for terrorist groups in the city of London. They could stay there and not be touched, as long as they did all their bombings overseas, then there was no terrorism in London. The French, for example, French intelligence service was furious. They called it Londonistan, but the British had made a, a safe haven for Islamist terrorists. Um, and finally, you know, it, it had to happen eventually. The Islamic extremists turned on the British and began bombings in London. And wouldn't you know the guy behind it was one of the very people, Aswat, that had worked for the British. There's an American connection, too. Aswat was uh, once sent to America to build up a terrorist base here. And I think it was up in Oregon. And the Justice Department authorized the indictment and arrest of everyone involved except Aswat. The guys above him and below him were on the indictment list. But he was never mentioned. He was just allowed to go free. 
So uh, it's a lesson in how the world really works. Uh, a lot of people who are involved in the war of terror uh, know that the Justice Department sometimes is on both sides of the war. Uh, we had an operation down here in Tampa where they're laundering uh, stolen vehicles from the United States, and the expensive ones were being sent to Kuwait and Qatar to be sold for money for Al-Qaeda, but the vehicles were turned into car bombs to kill American soldiers in Iraq. I mean, we had the VIN numbers, everything was traced. And uh, we had a bunch of agencies helping us, uh, Secret Service and Customs and ICE, and the FBI came in and shut it all down. It was just too embarrassing. A lot of the people the FBI had recruited, like Aswad, were double agents. You know, right under the nose of the FBI, these guys had been building terrorist networks in America. One of the reasons the FBI didn't share information with the CIA and other agencies was because it was too embarrassing. There was one guy here in Tampa, uh, Professor Sammy L. Arian. Everyone thought of him as a nice, genial Muslim professor, leader of the Muslim Students Organization. And um, my friends were telling me that uh, he was one of the world leaders of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Islamic Jihad is the most violent terrorist group uh, in, in Palestine, perhaps in the Middle East. And uh, he was ahead of it. And we had videotapes of uh, Professor El Aryan out of these fundraising meetings, you know. Who will give me $500 to kill a Jew? I tell you, this money is only for killing Jews, not for our administration. So uh, what I did was I donated $10 to Professor El Aryan's charities and then sued him under Florida law to see where my money was going. Was it going for a charitable purpose or was it going for terrorism? Well, what happened is my complaint listed all of the classified information I'd been given access to mm -hmm. and exposed El Aryan as one of the worst terrorists in the world. And, uh, you know, local newspapers couldn't believe it. This was sweet Sammy. And it, it turns out I was right. He really was a major terrorist. But uh, he isn't in jail. He's just sitting up uh, at his daughter's house uh, with one of those ankle bracelet things on. Uh, he's supposed to be charged with criminal contempt unless he tells the grand jury exactly how he got the money. But he, his lawyers say he's afraid to because he knows he'll be killed. And he may be right on that point. The money came, was laundered through Saudi extremists. They had a whole network of places set up at 500 uh, Herndon Road, uh, uh, certain road in Herndon, Virginia. So, uh, you know, 10 minutes after I filed my lawsuit against El Arian, the Justice Department finally raided the exact address, Operation Green Quest. And so at least in one hour, I closed down all the Saudi money laundering uh, networks in America. But yeah, the Justice Department has been protecting the Saudis. We've been on both sides of the war against terror. That nonsense has to stop. Now, uh, today we have Eric Holder in the Fast and Furious controversy. He's been found in contempt of Congress. Uh, is this probably the most public shame moment for the uh, Justice Department and the Attorney General? Uh, what do you make of the whole Eric Holder Fast and Furious case, and, and what does it mean for the larger Justice Department. As much as I dislike Eric Holder, he gets a green light on Fast and Furious. There is no evidence whatsoever that he even knew about it. This was started under a previous Attorney General of the Bush administration. Um, but the Justice Department is saying, look, you can't see our internal correspondence. That's executive privilege. Uh, I think it's a big mistake that there should be no executive privilege where a crime is suspected. Now, I know that this time on Fast and Furious, it's nothing more than a political stunt by the Republicans in the House of Representatives. And shame on them for doing it. But uh, I think that we should start looking behind executive privilege where clear and convincing evidence exists that the Justice Department itself may have participated in a crime under previous administrations. Because... The same rule would apply, should have applied to the Justice Department back when they were bringing Nazis into America. That was illegal, too. But they never got touched. Uh, 
Right, but so, that, was the, that was the thing with the gun walking was that Issa kind of brought out in the hearings that it was going on during Bush, and then suddenly they didn't want to talk about that anymore. And it's kind of that whole uh, Iran-Contra pattern, and something tells me it just goes on and on. Yeah, Issa now has backed off. He said, well, yeah, there really is no evidence that Holder knew. But we'd like to see the files anyway. Well, you can't have fishing expeditions. But yeah, Issa has now... Uh, backed off remarkably, because it looked like most of the evidence was going to point at Bush. I mean, George Bush was just this nice, genial guy who didn't have a clue. And the people around him did far more damage to this country than they realized. There are a lot of nice people in the Republican Party, but uh, their leadership has sold us out. Do you think the wiretaps are going to change the questions about Holder, prove that he knew more than uh, than we think he knows at this point? or I don't think that Holder knew. Yeah. Yeah. And, and nobody, none of my sources have said anything to me to indicate that. This was just, you know, a good example of a bad example. The House shouldn't have made this an issue. It was, it was fighting the wrong battle at the wrong time. What do you think about the larger gun walking issue and the larger uh, networks of guns trading for money, trading for drugs, and all this stuff? Oh, I think it's asinine. These things always got out of control, whether it's the DEA doing it or CIA. When you are giving aid and comfort to criminal organizations, somebody has to be looking over the shoulder from outside the agency and saying, no, wait a minute, guys. You know, come up to reality for a second. You, you know, one gun, maybe. 20,000 guns? Absolutely not. So, uh, you know, that... that things should have been scaled back right away. Uh, but there is very little supervision on covert agents. That's how Nazis got to be recruited for the intelligence service. Okay, final okay. question. What do you think is the best reform issue we can have with the clandestine issues, how these things get nested so secretly in the whole larger workings of national security, which obviously serves an important purpose? Uh, what What is kind of the main issue we should be looking at as we hope to maybe change the system for the better in the years to come? we get two options. You can either have a South African-style truth commission where everybody gets a wash. I think the simplest thing is that Obama, if he's reelected, should just pardon everyone who, within the executive branch, who committed a crime or knew of a crime, on the condition that they tell about all the other crimes that they had knowledge of. Can you imagine what would happen if the defense contractors all of a sudden had all the uh, Defense Department employees saying, yeah, I took a bribe from this company? It would break the back of corporate influence uh, in, inside the, uh, the executive branch. Uh, it's time that something very simple and very drastic should be done. It's way too late for justice, but maybe it's not too late for the truth. I would like to have these people come forward and say, yeah, yeah, we did it. It was stupid. It was wrong. At least we stand a chance of rescuing the next generation from the crimes that we failed to prevent. Let's hope Let's so. Hope. I didn't properly p plug your book, but it's excellent. It's a very interesting topic, America's Nazi Secret. We have it at InfoWars, but tell us just briefly how it's part of this larger project, part of the Belarus secret, how that was shut down. And then finally, tell us where we could find your work, your website. Yeah, uh, well, I, I don't have a website right now. I've just been recovering from a series of back operations. Sure. Never jump out of a perfectly good airplane. I wasn't <laughs> Um, but the book is um, everything that was censored out of my books over the last 30 years. After 30 years, the time clock expires. And CIA sent me a letter saying I don't have to submit my books for censorship anymore. I said, great. So the first thing I wrote about was all the things that CIA and Justice had censored out of my books in the last 30 years. And it gives you a real good idea. I used the, the Belarus, um, the Belarusian Nazis as an example, sort of a case study sure, in how sure. the system works and how the cover-up can continue. And uh, I wish that, in hindsight, that I'd focus more on the Arab Nazis than the Belarusian Nazis because of their current uh, advance. But, you know, I've written some pretty good books. Um, 
the secret war against the Jews is a history of covert operations against Israel. And it really is about the influence of oil money and oil power in world politics. So that's the secret war against the Jews. Unholy Trinity was about the Vatican, the Nazis, and the Swiss banks. The first book, The Belarus Secret, that became America's Nazi secret, was sort of a, a case study in, in how the lies take place. Well, John Loftus, I know you're a contributor on a lot of networks. I hope we can get you on again in the future because there's so much interesting things in history. It's so complex. Obviously, we can't tackle it all in one day, but it's just it's mind-blowingly interesting. Oh, it's, it's a fascinating subject, but history doesn't belong to the Republicans or the Democrats, to the left or the right. History belongs to us, and it is what it is. If, we, if America's made mistakes, well, let's admit it, understand it, and move on. That's what history should be about. George Orwell said that the most powerful form of lie is the omission. And it's the duty of the historian to ensure that those lies don't creep into the history books. Well, I'm a former prosecutor and that's what I'm about. I'm trying to make sure in my new career as a historian that we keep the lies from getting passed on to the next generation. Well said and well quoted. Thanks very much for joining us. Visit InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. When you're on the site, you can also tune in 24 hours a day to my daily radio broadcast. There's also a free iPhone app to listen to the syndicated radio show when and where you want.